This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I will be talking with a man named Paul Hutton, an expert on the American West. The focus will be uh, American film dealing with the Western, and we will begin in a moment. Well, in this show, uh, I'm going to be talking with Paul about uh, the American West as it's been portrayed on film, and we'll be talking about uh, the old silence through the early uh, serials, through the heyday of John Wayne, through uh, uh, Sergio Leone and the Spaghetti Westerns, and uh, things that have happened in the last few decades. But first, uh, I'd like to allow Paul to just give a few minutes, uh, introduce himself to uh, the viewers. Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background uh, regarding all things of the Old West. Well, good morning, Dan. I, uh, in my day job, I'm a professor of history at the University of New Mexico, and I've taught Western history for um, the last 30 or so years. And um, also, of course, I write about the West. Um, my main focus has been uh, the Army in the West and the Indian Wars, and then also Western popular culture, uh, how the West has been portrayed in novels and films in popular history. Um, I've written uh, several books, uh, Phil Sheridan and His Army, the Custer Reader, a book called Western Heritage, and uh, my latest is called The Apache Wars, and it's out from Crown this spring. and. Uh, will be uh, available everywhere. It's available for pre-order right now on Amazon. Yeah, I, a few months ago I did a show on uh, Elmer Kelton, who's uh, considered a Western writer, but I wanted to do a, a show on Kelton because he fits sort of outside what we think of uh, as the West. And uh, most of his books, or at least the, the ones that he's gotten the most uh, uh, renowned for, have been set in more 20th century times. And so... Uh, um, let, let's just talk about the Old West in general with films and whatnot. What are some of the major tropes that you would say that uh, uh, Western film has perpetuated uh, throughout the last hundred or so years that don't really uh, conform with the West as it was? And if it doesn't conform, is that necessarily a bad thing? Is, is the mythos of the West in and of itself is something that's interesting? Well, you know, there are certain traits that you find in almost every western story and we can trace these back in fact to buffalo bill's wild west show which was so popular from the 1880s up through the turn of the century uh into the era of the first world war and what buffalo bill did in his uh very very popular show was establish certain conventions uh you know the attack on the stagecoach the attack on the settler's cabin the ride to the rescue uh he would do historical tableaus of, of the Indian wars and of ranching and, and rodeo. So he kind of combined the circus with the rodeo and presented these stories of the West. And these were then adapted um, into the Western film when um, it came about at the start of the last century. 1903, the, the Great Train Robbery is usually regarded as uh, the first American film that told the story. And also... Of course, it was a Western based on the escapades of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, uh, although filmed in New Jersey. Hmm. So we really owe quite a debt to, uh, to Buffalo Bill, to the dime novels and pulp publications that preceded him, all of which helped to sort of establish what the Western was all about. Uh, and the story of the West had very much become, by 1900, the story of America. And people looked to the West for a unique American identity. And Americans are always searching for that. What makes us unique? What makes us different? And what makes us a nation? And the story of the West and the Western movement uh, gave to the United States something that no other people anywhere else had. And, of course, in the Western heroes that had evolved from Daniel Boone through Davy Crockett, Kit Carson, Wild Bill Hickok, Buffalo Bill, we found um, a through line that would tell the American story. Well, all of this then fed into the creation of the Western film. And these films are not historical in the sense that uh, certainly you watch a Tom Mix Western, which is a lot of writing and shooting. Um, uh, there's no connection to, to the history of the West, yet they still have a historicity about them. And they have certain conventions that are played out. <clears throat> Landscape, for instance, is always vital to the Western. And so 
these stories um, sort of all came together around 1900. And uh, that coincided, of course, with not only the success of Cody's Wild West show, but also the incredible success of Old Wister's novel, The Virginian, uh, the first uh, really truly great you know, Western novel after the success of uh, James Fenimore Cooper's Last of Mohicans and other leather stocking tales. And then with, uh, with that story, with, with Owen Wister's The Virginian, with Cody's uh, Wild West show, and then the arrival of Theodore Roosevelt as president of the United States, uh, who portrayed himself as a great Westerner, even though, of course, he was from New York. Uh, nevertheless, uh, all of that came together to just create a huge interest in the American West. Yeah, Wister's novel, I reread it a couple of years ago. Uh, it, that's sort of a landmark in the, the, the prose fiction of, of the West. Before then, it had been maybe 30 plus years of the, as you said, the nickel and dime uh, novels that were just basically, I think, almost a template for a lot of the silent films. The early silent westerns that you see basically have that very sort of almost Punch and Judy-like uh, quality to them in that the characters are not real. There's no real sketching in depth. There's always someone in trouble. It's always an Indian or a rustler, an outlaw. And uh, uh, Wister's novel, though, seemed to be something that set the stage for stuff that would come a little bit later with the guys like Hawks and Ford. Um, but you mentioned Tom Mix. He was probably, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably the biggest Western star of the silent era. Would that be true? I would say he would be. I mean, he followed a, a, a long string of uh, stars. The early films were indeed, just as you mentioned, very short little action melodramas. I mean, hardly far removed from the heroine being tied to the railroad track. Yeah. By Snidely <laughs> whiplash, and then rescued by the by the handsome cowboy, who then proceeded to kiss his horse rather than the heroine, and and so certainly that was part, part of uh, those early films. And a fellow named Bronco Billy Anderson, who had actually been in Porter's film, was in that film. And um, Bronco Billy was the first big western star, and. Uh, there were others, but in these short little melodramas, Texas Guinan actually was another who was a, a female version of Ronco Billy. But then came, along came William S. Hart, and he sort of elevated the uh, Western to a far more serious stage. And we saw with the work of William S. Hart and then Thomas Cruz's The Covered Wagon and John Ford's uh, The Iron Horse, these big historical Westerns. And so suddenly the Western began to be taken very seriously, and Hart was renowned for his realism when we look at it today it almost looks comic but nevertheless uh, it, it uh, was startling to people at the time and so William S. Hart really elevated the western story but by the mid-1920s his star was waning and indeed um, Tom Mix took center stage as uh, the great western film star and Mix would dominate the decade and that was all action all yeah. riding all shooting um no real history uh, being portrayed. And uh, some critics kind of see that as uh, a glory day of the Western because Tom Mix was so po popular, but also it's kind of a dark day because the Western uh, wasn't taken seriously anymore yeah. after, after what we had seen with William S. Harden, with the covered wagon, with the iron horse, these other big Westerns that had been made, big serious Westerns. Yeah, it was sort of ghettoized, uh, like most genres. Um, the 1930s with the sound, I think that's sort of when the Tex Ritters and the Gene Autrys came along and you had sort of the singing cowboy stuff. And uh, it seemed the 1930s during the Great Depression, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, there seemed to be a, a move away from anything about the Westerns other than like the real uh, serials, the, 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 the B or C level movies that John Wayne uh, spent a decade or so in. Even John Ford, I believe, had done a couple of Westerns in the 20s and then didn't get back to it until Stagecoach in 39. So the 30s seemed, at least from my perspective, it, it, that seemed to move more towards the, the Frank Cap with the sort of uh, the, the witty kind of urban uh, you know, the sophistic, the sophisticates with the Cary Grants uh, uh, or the, the Clark, Clark Gable types, uh, Gary Cooper types sort of dominating there, but not in, in any Western roles. Do you think the 1930s, there was a reason that there was a move away from uh, Western films uh, in, in, a, in a sense of being the, the popular thing? As far as I know, there wasn't any blockbuster Westerns in the 30s. Well, 
There, uh, one of the real problems was sound. The sound equipment of the day was so bulky and cumbersome, and so difficult to use outdoors. It was, uh, it was just tough to get good sound on those early westerns. And there were a couple of big budget westerns. In fact, John Wayne was in one of them. It was called The Big Tray on Made by Brown Watch. And it was a huge failure. And so it was a film uh, starring Donnie McBrown, um, uh, pro- directed by King Door, um, Billy the Kid. And um, both those films were huge, big budget westerns in the early days of sound of the, the veiled spectacularly. And so the western sort of retreated into the serials, which remained very popular. And into these, uh, the, the sort of clones of Tom Mix, and there just was a whole series of uh, of those kinds of westerns, and that indeed is where John Wayne, after the failure of the Big Trail, uh, spent ten years laboring yeah. in those films. And America, in in the Great Depression, was starting to have second thoughts about the triumphal story of the conquering of the American West. Well. Where was the triumph? I mean, what was happening? Everyone was uh, being thrown off the land. Uh, uh, it was the time of the Dust Bowl. And so sort of the glory of moving west with the pioneers uh, faded from consciousness. And of course, this was the time of the bootleggers and uh, the gangsters and, and the rise of the cities and the coming of immigrants. And so America was much more focused on, on those issues and moved uh, sort of away from the story of the West. Yeah, uh, we'll talk a bit more about John Wayne a little later on, but uh, recently over the last few months uh, this year, there's been a a few of these uh, sort of secondary channels that have come on that play old movies from the from different uh, uh, archives of like Columbia Pictures and whatnot, things like Get TV or the Movies Channel. And I remember seeing a John Wayne B film from the 30s, a Western, I think it was called something like The Wyoming Kid. That might have been the name of it. And it was an odd Western because it was actually set in the early 20th century. The guy was sort of uh, an Al Capone-like character that Wayne was going after. And it was a different role than John Wayne had played in the other B Westerns that I remember him from. And even different than a lot of his other Western characters. Um, Wayne seems to have, uh, could have gone one way or the other. I mean, the, he seemed to have more, from my perspective, when I saw him in some of the more straightforward roles that say uh, 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 there was a, a few films where he played sort of the romantic romantic comedy kind of lead in the 1930s and some B films. And then he developed his sort of cowboy persona. Um, do you think do you think that John Wayne uh, was sort of meant to be a Western, uh, you know, action hero? Or do you think that he sort of uh, segregated himself or ghettoized himself as an actor? Uh, just throwing that out. Well, certainly he had uh, done a lot of westerns in the in the '30s, so he became identified with the western. Um, and he also just had a natural air about him. I mean, he had a natural persona that made uh, him obviously the perfect western hero. I mean, it's it's sort of astonishing the following that he still has. Um, Forty years after his death, uh, he's still a huge, huge star. And, um, you know, uh, that's that indescribable quality, that's that kismet that stars have, and he, he had it, and of course he played many different kinds of roles, and he played, uh, you know, certainly a lot of action heroes that weren't Western, but obviously it's the West that John Wayne became so closely identified with. Yeah, I mentioned, I think it was in 39, when Stagecoach uh, was basically his breakthrough role. And uh, while Ford uh, had, you know, carved out a, a career for himself as the director, that was sort of his return to the Western in a big way. And it, it to me, a lot of people name some of his later films, but I still think that's probably the best of the Ford films. Yes, uh, in terms of the visuals, it's not as, uh, uh, you know, impressive as some of the later color works. But it had it had the best story. I think it was adapted from a stage play. Wasn't it, was it not stage play? It, it was indeed. It's a it's a, a, a remarkable film. It holds up very well today, and it has one of the finest star intros ever put on the screen, where mm-hmm. John Wayne first appears as the Ringo Kid, twirling his yeah. Winchester, and the camera you know comes moves toward him as the stagecoach moves toward him and goes into a tight close up, and every girl in America swoon. I mean, it was just uh, star quality written all over that. Uh, a great story, 
a great cast, um, very simple, you know, put, put people in peril, uh, a stagecoach, you know, being pursued by Geronimo's warriors and, uh, what will happen. And then the, uh, interior drama of the outlaw on the run and the prostitute with the heart of gold who uh, is going to redeem him and he's going to redeem her. It was just a really wonderful story and is credited with bringing the Western back. It was a huge success, yeah. uh, both critically and, and at the box office. It established John Wayne as a star and he would never look back uh, from that point on until the day he died. And um, a wonderful hit for Ford, who, who had, had indeed, uh, of course, carved out a magnificent reputation for himself as a filmmaker, but not in Westerns, in, in other types of films. But now John Ford also becomes uh, increasingly identified with the Western. Yeah, and the thing about Stagecoach, uh, it really had some strong female characters, something that was lacking in Westerns up until that point, as far as I know. And really, I think you might have to go, as far as I can recall, the 1940s didn't really offer many interesting roles in Westerns for women. I think maybe Johnny Guitar was the next film that maybe had, you know, really some complex female characters. Again, I could be wrong. Um, but the 1940s, that seems to have been the the John Wayne decade. I mean, he, I don't know if, if his films were always the box office champs. But this 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 especially was when he was in his prime, uh, He you know, with the Ford films. Uh, then Howard Hawks made some uh, great westerns in that decade. Um, was was World War II really the impetus for the the ascension of of the western uh, again? Uh, you know, in, into prominence uh, in film. Well, there were a series of big budget westerns that came out actually the same year as Stagecoach, and then followed in, in the years after uh, uh, Jesse James, Union Pacific, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's The Plainsman. Uh, uh, Gene Tierney as Belt Star, and all these big westerns came out, and uh, a lot of more historical westerns. And this was uh, uh, when Santa Fe Trail with uh, Errol Flynn and Ronald Reagan was produced. They Died with Their Boots On, starring Joel Custer with Errol Flynn, uh, came out in 41. Uh, in fact, the very month that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And um, obviously, the, the sort of patriotic tone of westerns worked well uh, as the country marched toward war. And uh, there was, though, a sort of a dip in the production of Westerns during the war itself. And, of course, this was, uh, as you would expect, the 1940s were a period of war films, uh, or heroic, propaganda-like war films. And um, John Wayne became one of the biggest stars during this period because, unlike um, Clark Gable and Jimmy Stewart and Robert Montgomery, he didn't go off to war. He yeah. stayed home and he made movies, and that's when he became the number one box office star. Um, other than uh, Hawks and Ford uh, and their films, what do you think were some of the seminal films from the 1940s? Uh, because one of the most astonishing films that I rediscovered years afterward uh, was uh, the film Yellow Sky, which has been called like a, a, a Western noir. And uh, it's just shot in this very high contrast, black and white. It's a very existential story of these guys who are, are thieves and robbers who squabble amongst themselves and basically have the undoing. I think the last couple of minutes uh, of this film gets a little Hollywood ending, but it's really an astonishing film uh, that, that I, I had remembered seeing as a child, but having seen 40 some years later, is really an excellent film. Um, that what what other films would you uh, say in the 1940s outside of say the Ford and Hawks are, are those that are these landmarks that people should uh, uh, inquire into? Well, we really do see a renaissance of the Western after the war is over. And another film, sort of along the same lines as um, uh, Yellow Sky, was um, Pursuit with uh, Robert Mitchum, which is a uh, very dark film noir. Uh, uh, we also saw the Oxbow incident released at that time, Will Wellman's film about uh, uh, lynching, which in, in many ways was a social commentary film, uh, but safely placed back in the story of the West, although it's based on Walter Van Tilburg Clark's uh, best-selling novel. Um, and John Ford returns to, uh, to the Western during this period, uh, with my darling Clementine, which 
is the film that really makes Wyatt Earp into a uh, great national uh, hero. He had been, there had been a couple of Wyatt Earp films before, in fact, based on, on Stuart Lake's book, the very same story that uh, John Ford took. Uh, one was Frontier Marshall in 1939 with Randolph Scott's Wyatt Earp, and then there had been another one, uh, another Frontier Marshall with George O'Brien as a B-Western uh, in the 30s. Uh, but it was Ford's My Darling Clementine that really captured the essence of uh, of the Western hero and helped to make Henry Fonda, of course, into uh, a major star and also... Uh, cement the place of the Western in post-war society. And then Ford, of course, goes on to do his uh, cavalry trilogy, which begins with Fort Apache and then follows with She Wore a Yellow Ribbon and um, Real Grande, all starring John Wayne, of course. Um, and at the same time, um, Howard Hawks uses Wayne in Red River, one of the most successful big budget Westerns ever made. And again, um, just like Ford was using history and My Darling Clementine about Wyatt Earp, Fort Apache, which is sort of a disguised version of the Custer story, uh, Hawks told the epic of the cattle trail and um, kind of based it on Mutiny on the Bounty. And uh, it made, uh, gave John Wayne a very different kind of role because he's the anti-hero yeah. in this film and sort of showed his maturity as a star. In fact, uh, John Ford later joked that he didn't know Wayne could act before he saw Red River. And so he started using him more. Well, Wayne obviously was a great actor and he knew it, but uh, but that was certainly a very different kind of role for, uh, for Wayne. And, and as it showed his maturity as a star, it also sort of showed the maturity of the Western post-war era. You mentioned Randolph Scott, and uh, in my mind, uh, you know, obviously he was never as big a box office star as John Wayne, but, uh, and a lot of people will associate Gary Cooper with the Westerns, uh, um, but Randolph Scott to me is almost a quintessential Western star because, uh, and we'll get a little bit later into what was known as the renowned cycle of the 50s and 60s, uh, so a series of films that he did that were not really related, but were produced by uh, uh, him and a few other people that worked on the same films. But uh, uh, I, I've looked at some of the Randolph Scott films. I was just looking up uh, a film that I had seen just a few months ago with the Desperados with Glenn Ford. And that was another interesting film because it had some strong female performances in that as well. Um, what what are your takes on Randolph Scott and also Glenn Ford, who did a number of Westerns too? Um, uh, where, where do they fit sort of in the Western canon as stars uh, you, a notch or two below Wayne in the Western firmament? Well, that's exactly where they are. There's sort of John Wayne, and then there's, then there's everybody else. I mean, certainly Gary Cooper is, uh, is right there with Wayne, uh, but Cooper, of course, did so many different kinds of roles. He never... Uh, became as identified with the Western, although he was, you know, a Western star, no question about it, and, and did classic Westerns, but he didn't become as identified as Wayne did with the, with the genre. And then below, um, certainly you would you would put Joel McRae yeah. and, and Randolph Scott uh, in that sort of firmament of great Western stars. And, and the thing about Glenn Ford and uh, William Holden, yeah. uh, Gregory Peck, um, all of the actors who made important westerns is that they were making other important films at the same time so they don't become as identified with uh, the western film but part of that is simply the fact that one third of hollywood's product in the 1950s and the 1960s were western films and so every big star whether it's it's uh Dick stewart or glenn ford or Martin, you know, um, they're all making westerns everybody yeah. Is in Western in those days, and uh, and some of them are good, and uh, some of them are not. But um, they're all they're all sort of interesting, and because so many westerns were being made, that the western goes off in all kinds of different directions. Of course. Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking of, of Glenn Ford and also Richard Widmark, who was in Yellow Sky and also played bad guys in all sorts of films. Uh, they were they were terrific actors, but yeah, they they seem to either consciously or somehow escape sort of the ghettoization of being just Western uh, actors. Um, uh, the 1940s then sort of gave way to, to the end to like 1950. And we saw, we see uh, around 1950s, I think, uh, a sort of change of the Western from 
sort of the more uh, triumphalist view, and I'd, uh, we can talk a little bit maybe about why that may have been, to some more cynical views, more focused uh, views on characters. The, the obvious first one that comes to mind is High Noon with Gary Cooper, which you know, is basically a character portrait disguised as a Western. We have the, this, uh, you know, man who has uh, his past coming back to haunt him. Uh, and no one in town, it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode. No one in town wants to step up and really help him, except I think the town drunk. Uh, and, you know, in you know he's going to succeed, but yet, because, because of the genres of the, uh, the conventions of the genre, but yet the way he succeeds and and the the tick tick ticking of the clock, the film really works, um, and that's always been considered, I think, a sort of a landmark film. Although some people have have not thought too high of it. What is your take on High Noon as a film and its place uh, as a western, and possibly as a western that had some effect on you know maybe a bottleneck western uh, that that changed the genre possibly? I think it changed the genre forever, forever, and it certainly is one of you know the handful of truly outstanding westerns and sort of like um, stagecoach in 1939 high noon comes along and really makes people take the western seriously um which is sort of interesting because when you look back on it today with uh, uh the song that tex Ritter sings throughout it um uh, you know could easily be farcical could be funny and of course after that you know all the westerns had songs kind of running a narrative thread through them for several years uh, but it really works uh, the song works and of course it won an academy award for dimitri tonk and ned washington uh, high noon also has been seen as a metaphor for mccarthyism and uh, i don't think there's any question that the writers meant it to be that and uh it, it's interesting for me it's a film that i watched as as you know a child, a young man, and, and never really appreciated. And then when I got older and had gone through some uh, episodes in my own life and some political struggles, you know, in, in uh, the academic world, uh, I came to really appreciate High Noon as a very important film, a great film, and, uh, and really appreciate Gary Cooper's performance in it. Um, just, a, just a fabulous film that really shows what the Western could be uh, when it was taken seriously. And of course, it's one of the films, it's one of the Western films that does not use landscape. It's very much an urban film. And that's that's because, as you said, it's a character study. Yeah, another star that uh, is really not associated with Westerns yet has probably at least half a dozen uh, great roles in Westerns and, you know, probably made 15 or 20 in his career is Jimmy Stewart. And I was thinking of like, underappreciated films like The Man from Laramie and uh, other stuff from uh, the 1950s. Um, what What is your assessment of uh, the career of Stewart uh, in the genre? And how do you think he fares as a Western hero versus his otherwise, you know, Jimmy Stewart roles outside, you know, as sort of the, well, I'm going, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington type roles. Well, uh, Jimmy Stewart's just a fabulous actor and he absolutely can do anything that. Uh, I think today you look at a star like Tom Hanks, and he's got that Jimmy Stewart uh, quality. Um, but it was in his Western roles that I think Jimmy Stewart really uh, came into uh, his own and, and showed some uh, showed the depth of his acting chops. I mean, which I don't think anyone doubted. But my goodness, in those Anthony Mann westerns, he's a very twisted character, uh, a very troubled character in many ways. And and John Ford uh, uses him to uh, perfection as as well in uh, Two Road Together, The Man Who Shot Liberty Bell. And so, uh, Stewart could just do anything. And uh, his, his Western characters um, tended to be, unlike the John Wayne character, uh, they tended to be weaker characters. Uh, that's not a negative. It's just that they're more human characters. And they also tended, of course, especially in the Anthony Mann films, to be driven 
Yeah, you know, the two stars, uh, uh, John Wayne and Stewart, uh, I th- I don't know if they ever got before together before Liberty Valance, the man who shot Liberty Valance, but you really see the sort of arc, the trajectory of these two Char- these two actors playing characters that they, in a sense, had played before in Westerns. And of course, it's the Stewart character that outlives the Wayne character, who's the big macho guy, who who's uh, actually the man who did shoot Liberty Valance. And uh, and uh, uh, it, that that's an interesting film. And uh, maybe we, we, we moved a little bit into the early 60s there. But uh, that's also sort of an iconic film uh, in its own right. I, I think it's sort of... it. it the contrast between the Stewart persona and and uh, and the Waynes uh, is to me the highlight of that film. Uh, just to, if you have any thoughts on that film, and we'll go back to the fifties in a moment. Well, it certainly plays off their personas and the personas that they had developed throughout their acting career. And indeed, Wayne plays John Wayne in that film, and Jimmy Stewart, you know, plays a much more uh, much more complex character as you would expect him to. Uh, it's a brilliant film. It's based on a Dorothy Johnson short story, um, and she did several great short stories that became important films. Uh, Man Called Horse is, a, is, uh, is another one of them. Um, the Man Who Shot Liberty Balance is a perfect film in a lot of ways. It, you know, it wasn't a big box office success despite its star power, uh, but it's held up well and, and usually is considered, you know, again, one of those handful of, of great American films, not just a Western, but great American films. And um, it reflected a growing cynicism on the part of Ford, you know, which happens as you get older, about sort of the state of the world. But it really um, harkens back to Port Apache, in which uh, a great American legend, the legend of Custer's Last Stand, is proven to be a fraud, but then protected by the hero, John Wayne, of that film at the end of the story. And we see the same thing. Uh, in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, in which uh, a great Western legend is proven to be false. But then Ford is saying, but no, no, the legend has power. Uh, The legend is what gives us identity as a people. It's what gives us pride in where we are. And so you protect the story. And that's sort of the quandary that Western historians have always faced, um, and Western writers have always faced. There's, There's this grand legend, and there's real truth to the legend. But of course, then there's a darker reality, and, and we see a sort of uh, war that goes on in filmmaking, in the writing of novels, certainly in the academic history world where I reside. We see this war that goes on between those who want to expose the myth as a fraud and those who see its value. Well, John Ford both exposed the myth as a fraud, but also saw its value, and that's what makes Liberty Ballad such a fascinating and complex film. Well, Lee Marvin uh, plays the the title character there, um, and he he often played uh, uh, bad guys early, and even through later in his career. Um, let's just digress for a minute or two. Um, throughout throughout the Western, you know, there had to be bad guys. Uh, I mentioned Richard Widmark, who was made a career out of playing bad guys in all kinds of genre. Uh, Lee Marvin, to a certain extent. Uh, identify maybe one or two, maybe three of the, the the actors who really played over and again bad guys in Westerns and uh, uh, their value to to uh, the cinema, uh, the, the genre. Well, certainly if you look at the B-Westerns, uh, and there are plenty of B-Westerns still made in the 1950s as well, there's just a, a, you know, a string of very familiar faces. I mean, one, one of those that was most familiar was a actor named Glenn Strange who played uh, uh, villains throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and then wound up as the bartender in his sort of golden years uh, in the television series Gunsmoke. Uh, uh, but a lot of actors uh, found uh, great roles as villains uh, in Westerns. Uh, Rod Steiger did, Glenn Ford often did, Widmark on occasion, although Ford and Widmark, you know, usually played usually played the hero uh, more often. Lyle Bettiger and Gunfight at the OK Corral you know, is, is, is uh, the ultimate villain. Um, there are some wonderful, uh, Lee J. Cobb was another, there were, Walter Brennan played a couple of really complex characters that uh, were uh, perfect Western villains. Um, in The Westerner with Gary Cooper, of course, he plays Judge Roy Bean as sort of uh, the good bad guy. And then in My Darling Clementine, he's old man Clinton. He's just the ultimate uh, 
sleaze uh, and uh, and a, a perfect villain who you know has raised up a clan of uh, little villainous troglodytes to do his bidding. And so uh, the Western has has produced some really fabulous uh, fabulous villains, and it's a great place for actors who want to uh, play those type of roles. Of course, you, the problem is you, you get typecast. Um, and that you'll never be able to break out. I'm forgetting the actor's name who played uh, the villain in the in one of John Wayne's last films, Cowboys, uh, Bruce Dern. And uh, Bruce Dern is a very fine actor, but it, he's such a perfect villain in that role. And of course, he kills John Wayne in that film. And so I think ever after that, uh, he was always typecast as, as these uh, terrible villains. Yeah, um, it's great villains. There's there's a, a Charlton Heston Western where he's sort of alone in a cabin with a wife and a son in the late sixties. The name slips by me. Um, it's, Will, it's Will Penny. Will Penny. That that's one of those character study uh, westerns that's that's right. really good. And uh, who the hell is it? Was it's not Ro Robert? Uh, not it's Duval Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance. Pleasance. Yeah, uh, yeah. He played Donald a real. Uh, was he famous for playing Blofeld, the villain in uh, James Bond. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to go back uh, and talk about two films that are generally associated with the 1950s Western. One that I think is grossly overrated and one that's very lauded and I think is still underrated. But before we do, you had mentioned earlier Joel McRae. And I just wanted to take a minute or two to talk about McRae because I remember a, a few months ago watching, uh, we talked about uh, Red River. And I saw a film called Cattle Empire, which isn't as great a film as Red River, but is I think, you know, a, a very good, solid B film. And McCrae did did a lot of these kinds of films that were played sort of second billing. Um, but they had some really interesting uh, uh, subplots. They had uh, some really interesting development. The, the whole cattle empire uh, uh, undertone was a guy redeeming himself from uh, something that had happened eight or ten years earlier. Talk a little bit about McCrae's uh, career uh, in the Western. Well, McCray, of course, uh, is like Jimmy Stewart. He's a very diverse actor, and he did a lot of uh, a lot of different kinds of roles. Um, I mean, he was famous, you know, during the World War II era for foreign, foreign correspondent, uh, for instance. And he uh, worked uh, with all the great directors. And he had done some big budget westerns: Union Pacific with DeMille, Buffalo Bill with William Wellman. Um, and in the nineteen fifties, he was in several, um, you know, well, there were big budget films, but they were still B films for the 1950s. And he often played historical characters, Ryder, Bat Masterson, um, in these films. And um, he, he sort of got typecast as, uh, as the stalwart uh, hero, but with some depth. Uh, to him, as you would expect, because he was such a such a fine actor. And Again, he's another one of those actors who, oh, we played Sam Houston, too, in the movie The First Texan. He's another one of those actors who, um, his early career, he was not a Western star, but then he becomes dominated by uh, by the Western uh, in the 1950s and, uh, and early 60s. And, of course, he finishes out his career with Randolph Scott in one of the two or three best Westerns ever made, Ride the High Country. Uh, an early Sam Peckinpah film. It's just, it's just magnificent, and uh, he's wonderful uh, in that film. He's also in one of my all-time favorite westerns, which is uh, called Colorado Territory, and it's a Rob Welch film, which is a remake of Rob Welch's um, High Sierra, and uh, with uh, Joel Gray and Virginia Mayon. I just, uh, I just love that movie, and I think it does uh, uh, a, a wonderful job uh, with the High Sierra story. And then he also did um, uh, another film that I recommend to everybody to see. It's called Three Faces West. And uh, it's uh, sort of a Billy the Kid story set in New Mexico with Charles Bickford as, uh, as Pat Garrett pursuing uh, the Joel McKay, McCray character, who's the outlaw, the one who actually uh, endangers his own liberty to help a family that's very ill. It's uh, a wonderful, wonderful film in which not a single shot is ever fired. So it's a good movie. The two films that I want to talk about uh, that are generally, although we've talked about High Noon and you can talk about Rio Bravo, the two films I think most associated with American Western in the 50s are The Searches in 1956 by John Ford and Shane, 
which was a George Stevens film. And I have to tell you, The Searchers, I think, is grossly overrated. Um, I think it's a very simplistic tale. It's it's not well acted in a lot of parts, especially Jeffrey um, Hunter's role. Um, there's there's the, the the paternalism, the bigotry that that uh, is not not it's not that Ford's character, uh, not Wayne's character, is a bigot. That's to be expected. But his character is so simplistic, and yet when I compare it to something like Shane, which came out two years before, Shane is like. Uh, the American West Beowulf. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's mythic. This character with no past comes riding in. It's told from the point of view of a child. So it, you, you get the, the, this larger than life character. And Alan Ladd was a small man compared to John Wayne. Uh, you get, you get the tension between the wife and, and, and Shane. You get Shane as the reluctant hero. He, he ends up saving the day. Uh, but it's not in all the ways you expect, and you actually get some realistic villains that you can actually understand the motivations in Shane, whereas you get nothing but really simplistic uh, stereotypes uh, in the searches. So uh, let's let me just have you opine on both of those films, and uh, if you, th- uh, I got a feeling you probably think I'm wrong about the searches, but uh, compare compare those two films to me because to me Shane is I think the great American western. Uh, I could put a couple of Leone films up with it, but to me, that's that's the one Western film made in America in the 20th century that I would recommend to everyone above all else. So go ahead. <laughs> well, in a lot of ways, I think Shane is the perfect Western. Uh, uh, and part of that comes from the simplicity of the story. It really is just a B Western uh, writ large on a great uh, uh, a great uh, landscape. And in that film, landscape is everything. And, and uh, George Stevens uses landscape so effectively. It's so interesting uh, to look at the differences between Jack Schaefer's novel, Shane, and, and the film. One of the most uh, uh, obvious is just in clothing, because in uh, in the novel, Shane is always dressed in black. He's almost like the Jack Balance character in the film. He's in buckskins, and the buckskins, you know, but are, are a symbol of the frontiersman and the freedom of the West. And so 
time and he slinks across the screen to get out of the way. That's just, that, I don't know how long it took him to get that dog to do that. It's so beautifully done. So yeah. it's, it's uh, I won't argue with you at all about Shane. It's a fabulous film. Well, Van Heflin yeah. also did 310 to Yuma, which is his other great uh, Western he role. Um, he, yeah, which is a, a, another fabulous film. And I, I must say, I like the, uh, the remake. Uh, although I thought the Indian was kind of crazy in the remake, but uh, I liked it. I thought it was I thought it was a good film, uh, but I love the original. I just think uh, the original is a well. I I I think oh. one of the great villains in that is the Riker character, Emil Meyer, because there's that great scene where he actually explains his motives, and he doesn't see himself as a villain. And you and when you listen to him talk about him spending thirty years making this country safe uh, for the Saad buses. You almost, you almost say, well, yeah, he's right in a way, and that's something that's very rare in any film that you get inside, uh, you know, the villain's mind like that, or the putative villain, and say, you know, maybe he isn't really a villain. Maybe he, he, he It's just a misunderstanding. Well, it really is a nice little debate right there in the middle of the film between he and uh, he and Van Heflin over the nature of the West and what the West was going to become, of course, uh, and. It, Riker's time is over, and of course, so is Shane's. Uh, the different, and, the, and Shane, in fact, has a line. He says, "The difference is, I know it." Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's a wonderful villain, and he's a very complex villain, and he doesn't want to use violence until he finally feels, you know, pushed to the edge. And uh, that was, of course, the story of, of the West. In many cases, we had, you know, great range wars in the West uh, between cattle interests and also between the cattlemen and the homesteaders. And, uh, and the higher guns, though, usually work for the cattlemen, not for uh, not for the homesteads. So let's go back to the searches, because uh, for me, uh, everything that Shane is, I don't find in the searches. I find the 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 lead bad guy, the Indian, is just such a stereotype. Jeffrey Hunter is such a an underdeveloped, predictable character. And then there's the scene when I watched the film four or five years ago for the first time after many years. There's the scene when uh, Wayne is in and a girl has been recaptured from the engines and, you know, he, he they, they're talking about, well, can she be sort of rehabilitated? And he has that look where he turns and the camera zooms in and you can see his eyes darkened. And I said right there to myself, I said, that's that's an unneeded emphasis. And it was interesting because I watched the DVD commentary and listened to it. Uh, the, the expert is saying that John Ford said that he did that shot particularly because he wanted to emphasize that Wayne was a was the bad guy here. And to me, that's an acknowledgement that the film at that point is failing because if you have to sort of take a black marker and underline that this guy is the bad guy and this happens maybe midway through the film, something hasn't been working in the film up to that point. So let me turn it over to you. What are, what are your thoughts on, on the film overall and some of my points vis-a-vis uh, -vis Shane? Well, to the point you just made, it's uh, part of what Ford as a filmmaker is having to work with here is uh, he has America's biggest box office star who, who always plays the hero playing the villain of the film. So he does want to underscore the villainy uh, of Wayne's character and the hatred that Wayne's character uh, feels. And that, that scene um, that you find so obvious, I mean, uh, you know, most critics say is brilliant. You know, the way he way he focuses in, and and uh, so many people feel that uh, that's Wayne's greatest role, and that's really where Wayne showed his uh, showed his chops as uh, as an actor. Uh, there's another scene where Wayne is uh, he realizes the Comanches have hit the cabin. This is earlier in the film, and but he has to rest his horses, and there's just another tight shot of his face as he is sort of. Uh, uh, cooling off his horse, and, and it's just uh, a very nice tight shot showing just how absolutely uh, tormented uh, he is. Um, yes, we disagree entirely on the searches, which I consider the greatest Western ever made. Uh, I just love it, and, uh, and and I must have seen it a hundred times, uh, truly. And uh, every time I see it, I'm just so amazed. My children won't watch it with me anymore. Because I say, oh my God, look at the way he frames that shot. I mean, it's just a masterpiece of filmmaking. Um, and I'll tell you how much I love it. Uh, the uh, love theme in it that plays every time uh, you see Martha uh, or, or the captive girl. Um, 
is an old Civil War love song called Lorena. So I love that movie so much. I named my daughter Lorena after the song in that, in that movie. Uh, I think that movie is so complex, and I love the fact that the hero, uh, John Wayne, is such a bigot, and it plays off the hatred. And there are weak characters, I agree with you, uh, uh, Jeffrey Hunters, uh, who can be a fine actor, he just seems too weak in that uh, in that film. And later, when Ford casts him as the hero in Sergeant Rutledge, I just find him a very, very soft, uh, soft hero. And... Uh, the actor who played uh, Scar, of course, which is a pivotal role, uh, is a German actor. You know, cast cast as an Indian. His name is uh, last name is Brendan, and he plays it. He plays Juan Parker later in Two Road Together. So it's sort of a puzzle why he's uh, why Ford would would cast him. But uh, you know, Ford uses Indians throughout his films, but always uh, the Indian leader is is uh, uh, a Mexican like Miguel Inclán in uh, Fort Apache. You know. Or, German actor, like we see in uh, Scar. Um, I think the film really speaks to the great themes of the West, to uh, racism, which was a central theme of Western history, to uh, conflict, of course, to the dispossession of the Indians, and to um, the sort of com complex racial relationships that existed in American society at the time. As we've sort of evolved and our racial attitudes have changed, uh, we've sort of lost the ability to really appreciate uh, what it meant that, you know, a white woman would be the wife of, a, of an Indian or, or there would be miscegenation. I mean, these, these are things that we accept now today. Uh, but, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, in the 1950s, he's dealing with a theme that is at the very heart of the greatest conflict going on in American society, race. And I think it's a very, very sophisticated film and daring in the way it deals with with race, uh, much like uh, Delmer Dave's uh, Broken Arrow dealt with the same things uh, in a much more straightforward way. Uh, but anyway, obviously, uh, I just, I just, uh, I just love the searchers. Well, let, let, let's let's uh, uh, end this segment and let's talk uh, in the next segment, starting with the 1960s with uh, Peck and Paw, uh, the Spaghetti Western, and uh, the cinema of the West uh, through uh, the last 50 or so years and how it differed from what came in the 50 years before. We'll do that in a moment. I'm here talking with uh, Western expert Paul Hutton, and we just had a nice discussion on the first half century or so of the American Western in cinema. Uh, to get us through the next uh, a half century or so, I want to just detour a little bit to the, the small brother medium of film and talk about uh, the rise, decline, and seeming oblivion now of the American Western on television. And of course, just like uh, the early uh, silent films and then the later sound serials, uh, a lot of the Westerns early on television were just these sort of uh, mindless shoot 'em ups. Um, to me, uh, I mean, you did have uh, then Gunsmoke came on and the Bonanza in the, the mid to late 50s. But to me, the best Western of the 1950s, and again, it's one that I just recently resaw uh, some episodes, is James Garner's Maverick. Uh, I think it was one of the, the shows that presaged, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a show on the golden age of television. I, I'm positing it 1960 to 1980. Maverick was a couple years early. But the breaking of the fourth wall, the self-referentiality, the, the depth, I mean, by a, a good decade, it, in a sense, was postmodern. And James Garner, uh, especially, even though he wasn't the only star of that uh, show, uh, I think there were th maybe three Maverick brothers that they had rotating for a while. But James Garner is, is perfect in that role. And it's a, it's a show that, unlike a lot of the other shows that when they might deal with, say, the racism against Native Americans, or or the triumphalism of uh, the the golden uh, or the Gilded Age, it actually it actually took points of view that were unpopular. So, if you could for a little bit, just talk about Maverick and some of the TV shows of the fifties, and how, if you agree with me, that Maverick was uh, a standalone. It was sort of non pareil in its era. It certainly was a high point of the television western, no question about it. And you're absolutely correct. I it runs on the Western Channel uh, pretty regularly, and those episodes really hold up. And Garn, of course, um, if you were a kid watching it like I was back 
television then created a whole series of film stars, uh, such as Steve McQueen, uh, that uh, used their television success to make themselves into uh, into movie stars. And Maverick certainly was uh, a highlight of those of those shows and was part of a series of Warner Brothers Westerns and Warner Brothers got into Westerns in a big way on television. They would use old clips from um, their films. So it gave a sort of big budget feel. Uh, one of my favorite shows was Cheyenne with Clint Walker and they did a uh, two parts uh, series on Custer's Last Stand and that and they used clips from They Died With Their Boots On to make it look like a huge production. Uh, and Cheyenne was very successful, so was Lawman with John yeah. Russell uh, and uh, Laramie and Bonanza. Uh, Bonanza. The list is just endless. Yeah, the Bonanza and you mentioned the Virginian. There was a, a television show on the Virginian. Um, Bonanza and the Virginian both kind of come along late and are incredibly successful. And Bonanza, of course, helped to usher in for NBC the era of color on yeah. television because it was one of the first series shot in full color and everyone, it was such a big hit, everyone had to go and get a color television. So that helped to bring uh, uh, color to uh, to TV. And color, of course, is so important to the Western, especially if you're using landscape. Although so many of the television Westerns, you know, by their very nature, were, um, you know, interior filming. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all urban Westerns, they're all in town, certainly Gunsmoke was. Very rarely did Matt get on a horse and, and ride somewhere. Um, they eventually just ran out of stories, they ran out of steam. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it almost became, the Western became so prevalent, both on film and in television, that it almost killed itself by open exposure. Yeah, probably my favorite Western was the comedy F Troop. I remember watching it as a boy. Uh, but uh, uh, two two shows before we get back to films proper that I, I just want to get a comment from you on um, that to me stand out along with Maverick as interesting shows that probably failed in, in one way or another were after the Twilight Zone, Rod Serling did a show called The Loner which I think only lasted a season and a half about a guy. It was sort of a precursor to the Kung Fu, which came in the, the 70s, about a guy who just sort of came into town and he had these little adventures. And they it sort of commented on what was going on in the 60s. It was one of the few shows that dealt with political issues, of course, coming from Rod Serling. Uh, and then the second show, of course, is The Wild Wild West, which was sort of what now people might call steampunk uh, in that uh, it had sort of futuristic sci-fi fantasy elements to it. Um, can you comment on either of those shows? Uh, if... well, I, don't, I don't remember The Loner very well. I believe that was with Lloyd Bridges. Was yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I, I did see a couple episodes, and it, uh, uh, because of the connection with Rod Serling, you know, you know it, it's, uh, he's such a genius. It, it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating show, and uh, uh, Peckinpah also did a, a failed Western during this period with Brian Keith that, uh, again, you look back on and go, oh, my goodness, there's really something there. Um, and Wild Wild West, of course, again, comes at toward the end of the Western, and they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we keep this alive? Well, family stories were big, of course, uh, the Big Valley, the High Chaparral, uh, both kind of playing off the family unit in Bonanza, and they kind of kept the Western going, and certainly the Wild Wild West, I think, in a lot of ways was the most successful of those. Uh, it kind of played off the James, the success of the James Bond films and the whole idea of spies, yeah. and uh, certainly has uh, retained sort of a cult following and was uh, very successful for its time. Um, so let's, if we move back to films, the 60s and 70s, to me, really the two names that dominate director-wise are Peckinpah in America and Leone uh, uh, from Italy, who wasn't the founder of the Spaghetti Western, but we'll talk about them in a moment. I, I wanted to just talk about two other things before we get into those two uh, people. And the, the first one is, for me, again, a very overrated Western, was uh, The Magnificent Seven. I mean, it's not a bad film, but if you compare it to Kurosawa's uh, Seven Samurai, it's such a come down. And, you know, Yul Brynner, as interesting as it is to watch him in the film, just sort of creaks along like the robot he later did in Westworld. And uh, to me, it, it was that was sort of like the death of the old classic Western there. I mean, it's just 
larded, it's slow, it's creaky, and you can see why Peck and Paul could step into the void afterward. Do you agree with that assessment? No, I, re I like uh, the Magnificent Seven a bit more than you do. I think that uh, it does play off Western conventions, and each one of the particular characters is sort of a stereotyping including Eli Wallach, who does a wonderful turn as the Mexican bandit leader. Um, but it certainly worked. Now, you know, you can't compare it to Kurosawa. I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's unfair. Because he was that Seven Samurai is such a work of genius. Um, if you saw Seven Samurai first and then you saw the Magnificent Seven, of course it destroys Magnificent Seven for you. But if you uh, if you saw Magnificent Seven first, especially as a kid, and you were, were wowed by it because uh, the characters are so interesting and, and essentially kind of cool in that 1960s way. And then you saw Kurosawa later, like I did. You, uh, you, you appreciate Kurosawa sort of separately from Magnificent Seven, which is a bad remake of a, of a magnificent film, but still as a Western, I think, I think works. And now, of course, it's being remade. It's being remade right now here in New Mexico. They're reshooting it. Uh, mm. Denzel Washington in, uh, in the lead. So that'll be an interesting take on uh, on the story. Uh, I think the the reason um, uh, Magnificent Seven works so well one is the music. I mean, Elmer Bernstein is just yeah. a fabulous theme, and then the characters are so interesting, um, and each of them playing very much off a of Western stereotype. But it's kind of a film that helped to make uh, Steve McQueen into a Western star, um, even yeah. more so than Ronald Dead or Alive, the television series. And, and what Sturgis did in making the film is he, he took these, uh, these television stars and used them very effectively. Uh, you know, in that, in that film, and, and it's sort of fun to watch it because you see all of these future movie stars in these sort of small, you know, small roles. Um, I want to just take a step backwards before we head to Peckinpah and Leone. And we've mentioned Randolph Scott. And... There was a series of B films that he did that were, in a sense, unconnected. They don't share the same fictional universe uh, known as the Renown Cycle. And I never even had heard the term until a couple of years ago, but I remember most of the films and I've watched a few of them on some of these old channels that I'd mentioned. And I really got a, a, a renewed uh, respect for, for Scott and his roles because in a lot of his roles, he's sort of the stiff He's sort of the stiff cowboy type, the the do-gooder, you know, the Dudley Do-Right kind of character. But he's quite subversive in some of these uh, these roles. Uh, in I think it's seven films that were directed by Bud Badick and produced by him and Harry Brown, uh, meaning Scott and Brown, hence the name Renown. Um, can you talk a little bit about these films? Um, uh, were they, you know, they were sort of B films. How were they received at the time? And how how have they sort of risen in the the sort of canon of Western films uh, since then, because while you could argue none of them are great cinema, they are, they are a lot better than you could would think from from some of the premises that uh, the films are, are based on. What what are your takes on those films? Well, they really have developed quite a following and a lot of critical acclaim. And I have uh, some you know, sort of friends in um, in the business who uh, uh, just worship. Them. And just think they're they're sort of the epitome of uh, of Western. And uh, I've often uh, I've watched them all, trying to understand how how, they, how my friends are so crazy over these movies. It just shows how tastes differ. Uh, they're all superb. I mean, they're all excellent films, uh, but they are kind of be westerns. And uh, and and Scott um, does play a complex character in each, but it's the same character. Uh, but you can, but they're. They're just marvels of craftsmanship. They're just so well done, and of course, uh, Lee Marvin is in uh, is in them as well, and uh, and so they're they're great. There's great casting and and great character development, and and so they do play off character very strongly. Um, and so I agree that they're all superb films, and they're better. It's interesting. They're better, I think, than you know. Joel McRae was making essentially the same kinds of films, mm -hmm. uh, although they tend to be you know wider, Bat Masters and Sam Houston historical sort of films. Uh, and his are not as good. His are not as strong as those films. Those films all have a very distinct point of view. You know, you're watching a Bud Boucher film. Uh, they really, they really work. 
as you mentioned, Maverick, just how clever it was. Yeah. That's what I would say about those films. They're so clever and they're just superbly well done. Yeah. You, you my favorite. You know? My favorite of them is Buchanan Rides Alone, and in it, uh, you see how how well choreographed it was. The comedic timing uh, of some of the fight scenes, of some of the you know uh, the the quips that you know it really is a revelation. Because if you only saw Randolph Scott before these films, you almost wouldn't know it's the same actor. Yet he's playing Randolph Scott. It's almost as if he's doing a meta take on his own persona, which is something that we talked about Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne. I don't think either of them ever really did a role that did a meta take on what they had established beforehand. Yet throughout that whole thing, it's Randolph Scott sort of playing Randolph Scott. And there's almost a sense, you, and, and I, I don't recall if there's any direct breaking of the fourth wall, but it's, it's almost a sense as if he knows he's in a fiction because he has this kind of cocky attitude in most of those films that he knows that, you know, he's the star. films that talks directly to the point you just made is that he rides the same horse in every movie that's okay. very distinctive you know <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just such a distinctive animal and it's 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 almost like you know the lone ranger always right you know same costume same horse even Matt and dylan of course always had the you know the same outfit on for 20 you know about 25 years uh and you certainly see that with uh with randolph scott he really is playing randolph scott and he really you know you don't need to change up horse i know he loved the horse and yeah. it's the horse he always used but it's such a distinctive animal that always struck me in those movies because he's playing a different person each time but, yeah and you, know, you, you can always depend on that horse being there. and and so that sort of leads into peck and paul because he's always looked at as sort of the guy who subverted what came before him in the west and uh, but I think he, I think a lot of Peckinpah, Peckinpah had to have seen uh, some of these uh, Baedeke films because I think there's a lot of the attitude, a lot of the the scenes in Peckinpah where where he he's doing some of that uh, uh, conscious kind of subversion of what came before. So let's let's talk about Peckinpah before we hit the spaghetti westerns. Um, uh, Ride the High Country was that his first western? Uh, he had done television work, and he had worked for a long time in television. Uh, and um, he had done a, a Western with uh, Brian Keefe and um, Maureen O'Hara that was made, uh, which was not successful. But And then he used that to make the Brian Keefe television series, The Westerner. Uh, Peckinpah's uh, script was the uh, uh, first use of the Rifleman character, so he created the Rifleman television series. So he was very successful as a writer in television, and he loved uh, and he loved the Western, but certainly um, Ride the High Country was the breakout film for him in terms of critical acclaim, although it, it 
it's interesting. I remember that was in '68. The Wild Bunch came on, and back then movies would play for a couple of years uh, if they were successful. And I remember being about five and seeing The Wild Bunch in, in theaters, and and I, 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 you know, it, I, I think it's a, a very good film. But you skipped over a film that I saw the restored copy on DVD of Major Dundee, and I have to tell you, I think that is Peck and Paw's best film. Um, I think it, it's it's got a complexity. It deals with with bigotry and racism. It deals with corruption. Uh, you have the putative hero by Charlton Heston, and Heston gives one of his best performances ever as Dundee. Uh, I I never saw the you know the the famously mutilated version, but the restored version is is just really fantastic. And unlike the Wild Bunch, I didn't see I didn't really see the ending coming a mile away. Even as a kid, you always knew that these these guys in the wild bunch were on a sort of suicidal mission. And I think, you know, it, it certainly has some great visual poesy. Uh, and in that way, Peck and Paul is certainly the, the descendant of Ford. But talk to me, uh, have you seen, first, have you seen the restored version of Major Dundee? Well, yes, and I, I love Major Dundee, because I love anything Peck and Paul did. I mean, I love bad television that Peck and Paul did. Um, <laughs> and Dundee is just one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, you know, just like The Magnificent Seven is made by its music, uh, Dundee really suffers from its music, which was imposed by the studio. And it almost ended uh, Peck and Paw's career because uh, it failed so uh, so dramatically. And they were going to fire him during the making of it. Charlton has intervened and said, uh, I know we're you know, running long. I'll, uh, I'll uh, guarantee my salary against, uh, against the film if you will just keep you know, Sam on. And he, he's in his memoirs, he says, I never dreamed they would really take my salary. They did. They took his salary. He worked on that film for free. It's one of his best roles. He really is. Uh, and we haven't really talked about him as a Western star. He's known for so many kinds of roles, but he really was a fabulous Western star. And I don't think he was ever better than in, uh, in Dundee. And he's, uh, he's so conflicted. And that's the hallmark of the great... Um, Peck and Paw characters, and I, I would uh, point to the Robert Ryan character in Wild Bunch. He's the Major Dundee character. He's a conflicted character. Uh, the same character is James Coburn and Pat Garrett, really the kid, the Pat Garrett character. And they're all Peck and Paw. Yeah. They're all playing Peck and Paw. Uh, and uh, it's just wonderful to watch. Uh, and Peck and Paw was one of those incredibly uh, self destructive human beings. And uh, it's so sad because he, he kills himself uh, essentially, you know, with drinking and drugs uh, at a very young age. And uh, he could have, I'm angry at him for, for dying like that because he could have lived on and made some more great westerns and made, maybe kept the genre alive a little longer. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, and it was also Bring Me the Head of uh, uh, Alfredo Garcia. I guess, was that his last western? And talk about those two late westerns uh, a little bit just for a few minutes. Well, Garcia is so so much fun because, uh, and, and it, it, like Dundee, doesn't quite work as a film, but, you know, if you love Peck and Pie, you just love it. Um, but in that, the Warren Oates character, who Peck and Pie used so effectively in all his films, the Warren Oates character finally gets to be a star, and he's playing Peck and Pie, even to the way he dresses and the sunglasses and everything. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just amazing. The only time I've, I've seen something like that is in an old John Ford film, uh, Wings of Eagles, in which Ward Bond actually plays John Ford in the, uh, in the movie and does an impersonation of him. Um, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, I, I think it is um, certainly the best to me of the 70 Billy the Kid movies. Billy, the story of Billy the Kid has been filmed more than any other Western story, and 70 times, can you believe it? Wow. This, of course, includes films like Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, um, Peck and Paws is the best, and uh, it's because of the James Coburn character that tormented uh, Pat Garrett, a man out of step with the new world who has to sell out in order to survive, and realizes that in killing the kid, he kills the best that was himself and the best that was the West. And, you know, when he kills the kid, the West is over. And that's the theme, of course, in all of Beck and Paw's films. Uh, it's the end of the West. You can only play that film, that, you know, theme so many times until people say, oh, well, the West is over. And so in that sense, uh, it becomes increasingly a theme in Western films. If you even look at uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, exactly the same thing playing out. The West is over. 
uh, and we're just simply uh, nostalgically lamenting it. Um, obviously, Wild Bunch released at the same time, you know, has a much edgier take on that West than Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but the ending is exactly the same in uh, in both films. Now, before we talk uh, and wrap up with the post Peck and Paul Hollywood, I, I want to just you know divert over to the Spaghetti Western, and uh, obviously, out of all of the Spaghetti Westerns, and we can talk a little bit just how that uh, evolved uh, in Italy. Um, see, you know, Sergio Leone is certainly the grand master he's the titan of the spaghetti western and uh so uh, first if you can just take a minute or two and just talk how how did the westerns become so popular as an art form i would assume it was world war ii that sowed the seeds for the spaghetti western well it was actually buffalo bill's wild west and the show had such success in europe and so many people saw it and so many people remembered it that uh, there are still in, in Germany today clubs, Western clubs, that people dress up, you know, like cowboys and Indians, and go out and camp out. Uh, and an intense interest in Italy as well. And if you look at the pop, pop culture in those countries and around the World War II era, uh, of course, in Germany, you had the Karl Mai novels, you know, Old Shatterhand, which were very, very successful. Uh, in Italy, there was a series of comic books. Uh, Kit Carson was a big hero. And, uh, and uh, these. The, these kind of kept interest in the West and the Western alive, and American Westerns played very well over there. But of course, it's Leone uh, who takes an American TV star, Clint Eastwood, and makes him into an international movie star in in that that incredible trilogy of uh, of Westerns that uh, changed the Western. And uh, a lot of people believe that. Uh, Leone influences uh, Peck and Paul. I don't really think so, so much, except for the violence, the starkness of the violence, certainly. Uh, but the, the sort of traits that we see in the uh, Leone films and the other, uh, you know, endless number of uh, foreign westerns, I don't really see in, in Peck and Paul's work at all. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, Italian westerns, although I must say, and maybe it's just because the characters are so fabulous in Once Upon a Time in the West. I just, I love Once Upon a Time in the West, and I think uh, that has some of the best Western theme music. I'm a big aficionado of Western soundtracks. Uh, I think that has some of the best music in any Western film. And uh, Bronson's fabulous. Jason Robards, of course, is fabulous. Buddy uh, Cardinale, of course, always looks great, uh, whether she can act or not. And uh, that film just works on every level. And then Fonda, you know, the ultimate Western hero is the ultimate Western villain is, uh, is fabulous. Yeah, well, I, I would, I would, you, you had mentioned The Searchers and uh, Wild Bunch. I would put Shane and Once Upon a Time in the West as the two sort of crown jewels of, of, of the Western. Um, but I think of the five Westerns that he did, you know, Fistful of Dollars, again, is a knockoff of Kurosawa, although I think it's a much better film than uh, Magnificent Seven. Um, and that that establishes the character. And it should be said that there's no there's no direct uh, connection of the Eastwood characters from film to film in those that trilogy. That he's called different things in the different films, um, and we and we don't even know if it's even chronological uh, uh, chronological. It's there, there. It, it sort of works like Bud Pottinger's films with Randolph Scott. Yeah. Each, 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 you know, man has a different name. Each main character has a different name. Well, of course, there's no name in, in, in Leone films, but it, he's playing the same guy over and over, you know, just a different setting. But it works. It just works. Now, then, the second one, Fistful of Dollars, talk about Lee Van Cleef, because we mentioned, uh, we mentioned uh, villains, in, and uh, he had been, you know, a, a secondary guy, a uh, in, in a lot of uh, film noir, he'd been in. Uh, he was in. Uh, was he in, he in High Noon? He's in High Noon. He's, he's one of the three right. Guys and the and movies. you know he, he he was that guy had the interesting kind of face, but it's really in uh, a, for a few dollars more that he then that sort of established him that he had another fifteen twenty year career over in Europe uh, that you know he lived off of, from that role. Um, talk. And, you know, if you talk about characters, uh, who's the fellow who's the villain in the first film, the Mexican guy who then comes back um, in the second film? Uh, oh, uh, well, let me look it up. Well, it's for a few dollars more. Uh, oh, John Maria Vol Volante. Yeah, he, he, play, he plays such a, a, a couple of really, I mean, almost 
ultimate bad guys in a in a sense uh, uh, in in those films and and the 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 the, the introduction of drugs and the surrealism that uh, uh, is in some of those first two films, but then. You know, you talk about the trilogy, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, that's to me just a, a hair's breadth below uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. I mean, you have the famous three way shootout. You have, uh, uh, you mentioned Eli Wallach in The Magnificent Eli Seven. Right. That, that's that's a precursor to probably his, I don't know if you could say it's his greatest role, but certainly his greatest Western role is in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly because he's such a cowardly little shit that, you know, uh, but yet you, you, you want to see him on screen. Um, uh, so talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, for a moment, if you, if you could. Uh, um, it's sort of interesting. Unlike the other two films, it, it's on a big epic scale. Yeah. And of course, Leone was having such success. It's almost like you have to do a big epic back it up. And he, he really does that in Once Upon a Time in the West. That is his sort of how the West was won. You know, it's just magnificent overblown uh, epic it kind of works against it but also works for it as a as a film um but uh yeah wallach is just so fabulous in uh, in that film and uh it's interesting how these foreign films really help to um rejuvenate the careers of these western character actors and um, certainly levi cleave who had had been um uh you know, in minor roles in uh, in American uh, cinema, although in some important films, he's also in Man Shot Liberty Valance. He's yeah. one of the, the thugs in there, but he's kind of like he's with Strother Martin, and, and his career was going on the same arc. Lots of work, but you know, you're not getting anywhere. But he becomes a star in Europe and does a whole series of Savada films that are very successful. And um, you know, now you can turn on the Westerns channel and see him all the time in in these in these starring roles. And uh, of course, Clint Eastwood is the best example of how it took an American television star uh, and turned him into an incredible international film star. Eli Wallach already was, of course, highly respected as a you know as a film star uh, by critics everywhere. But uh, Eastwood, I think, is a remarkable uh, case study of uh, of stardom. Uh, and talk about taking a wild chance to go over and make a you know a western in Italy, uh, but it works. Yeah, and you mentioned Once Upon a Time in the West. That's one of those films that I would put with something like La Dolce Vita, is that it's a kind of film that there's not a bad scene in it. There's nothing that doesn't work. There's not a bad performance. Uh, the the visuals are all great. Whether I mean, the, there's a famous scene where you see Henry Fonda and Claudia Cardinale talking to one another, and then the camera turns and you realize they're in bed. Um, right. And uh, it, it's just got so... It's like he, he threw everything in the kitchen sink... Uh, in that film, and it all works from the very beginning with uh, the drip, 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 and the three guys waiting in the dusters at uh, for harmonica, and then to the slow reveal of of harmonica's past uh, as uh, the young, uh, uh, I guess it would be Mexican or Indian, uh, you know, who is forced to keep his brother on his shoulders, and 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 then the very utter subversion of Henry Fonda as the bad guy, who's a guy who's who has really no bounds. And yet you you see there's that scene where Bronson, uh, as Harmonica, is actually helping because he doesn't want anyone else to take out Fonda until he does. Right. And so right. you get this, you, you, you really get in, in the two and a half or whatever hours it is, you it's almost like an, uh, you know, a thousand page novel. There's so much going on in it. It is. It's the war and peace of the Italian Western, or I would just say the European Western, and it's a masterpiece. Of course, it's shot in America, uh, but uh, it's it's Leone's masterpiece to me, and uh, it's the one. It's the one foreign Western that I come out of the bunker on and surrender and say this is really a, a fabulous. Film. Uh, and the last Western uh, is, I guess, one of those films that's sort of like the Wild Bunch is actually set after sort of the close of the West. Uh, Duck you sucker. And uh, uh, that it's it's a very odd film. It's a film that I think is underrated, but yet has some serious flaws. I mean, from the 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 Coburn characters, every time he appears, you know, Sean, 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 the the little uh, Greek chorus that that greets his character in just about every scene, every flashback. Um, what is your take on that film? Because it's a film that's really almost forgotten by a lot of people. I remember when it came out. I think it came out when 
It was called A Fistful of Dynamite. They were trying to tie it back to the right. earlier films. I remember, I mean, I saw it when it came out. I haven't seen it since. It's, okay. uh, it's interesting to me in, in that the girl almost became a subgenre of the Western hero goes to Mexico yeah. and in the revolution that come about after uh, the success of The Wild Bunch. And it's certainly uh, one of those. Robert Mitchum made a couple of those during this uh during this period, of course, it's got Rod Steiger in it. So, I mean, if you've got James Coburn and Rod Steiger in your film, you're going to have to work really hard to make a bad movie. I mean, you've just got such great talent involved. And I think Coburn was one of the really underrated actors uh, of the late 20th century. When you think of how he could do such wonderful Western characters like in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid or The Magnificent Seven, and then also do like comedy, like in, you know, Our Man Flynn. Uh, that silly uh, spy series, but it's a very successful series of films. And then was such a great character actor in so many films. He was, uh, he's really underrated in terms of. Uh, yeah, he, I remember uh, there was another film he did with uh, Bronson where Bronson plays a, a turn of the century pugilist and he's sort of the gambler. I forget the name of it, but. Um, that's right. I re- yeah, yeah. He and Bronson are both in that same sort of category. And both of them really have, at the end of their careers, uh, a real star turn. Yeah. And certainly Bronson, you know, is, is the classic example of the one who comes out of Magnificent Seven doing very well. He goes on, of course, to be a huge uh, star, not just in Westerns, but just a big Hollywood star. Well, so let's let's end, end this interview and just talk sort of uh, the last sort of third of a century since sort of the, the eclipse of uh, Peck and Paw and, and Leone and... Uh, uh, it seems to me, and I I can't say that I was a great Western fan growing up. I've grown uh, in appreciation from them uh, over the years. Uh, has there been anyone, you know, from 1980 on that has done a, a number of Westerns of any real substance? I mean, is there anyone that's the Bud Baedeker or the, or the you know, uh, Glenn, uh, not Glenn Ford, uh, John Ford uh, of the last, you know, third of a century? Because it seems... That the 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 genre has died out. The spaghetti westerns, if they're you know they're 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 part of history too. Um, you get the occasional you know uh, uh, Jesse James movie or or you know the OK Corral type film you know uh, with a lot of young stars, uh, the Brad Pack kind of things. But what 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 has happened to? It? And do you think the the western is is pretty much a dead as a genre now, or do you see any renaissance coming? Well, I think the western is coming back. I mean, what really happens in the in the uh, late '70s and, uh, and and '80s? I mean, part of it is changing attitudes within America and changing attitudes about the American past, but also just the death of all the great uh, Western stars and filmmakers. Ford dies, Peck and Paw dies, John Wayne dies. Um, you know, and Wayne alone could sustain the Western because uh, he had such a built-in audience. And so, once you see the passing. Of those uh, of those talents, it's really uh, you know only uh, a few stars, not directors, but stars that keep the genre alive. Kevin Costner, Clint Eastwood, um, and they're going to uh, you know work to keep the western alive. But well, I do think there is a western renaissance going on right now. It's never going to be like it was. It's never going to be thirty percent of Hollywood's product. But I think. We can see the Western um, still being strong, and it's so interesting to me that the only Western that ever won the Academy Award um, was a, a Richard Dix film based on an Edna Ferber uh, novel. For some reason, I'm blanking the name of it. Back in the back in the 30s, uh, about Oklahoma, and um, that won Best Picture. And then the Western, despite all the magnificent Westerns made, won Best Picture again until. Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven. And so once the Western sort of died, it was taken seriously again. Uh, in in the last third of a century, what, what do you th- think, if, uh, if you could pick maybe one or two films that you would say ranks with the sort of golden age, maybe not at the Shane uh, or the Leone or uh, the Ford level, but what is there one or two films that you think that in a hundred years people will say, yeah, that, that belongs in the same league? Well, certainly films have, um, you know, have done well at the box office and been critically acclaimed. Um, Dances with Wolves, obviously, um, 
um, television, of course, Lonesome Dove, and it was Dances with Wolves, Lonesome Dove, and the first Young Guns that helped to bring the Western back. And John Fusco, who did Young Guns, later did Hidalgo, is one of the people who tried to keep the Western alive. Uh, he's got a television series uh, now, Marco Polo, so he's, he's doing Westerns in China now. Uh, and then Tombstone, which was such a phenomenal uh, success, both critically and uh, and at the box office. Uh, and Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, of course. Uh, so those are, you know, the Westerns that kind of come to mind. And we, you know, recently we've seen, you know, great success with, with the Django film that uh, Tarantino did. And he's got uh, a new movie coming out just, I think, next month, uh, his new Western, uh, The Hate the Late. Um, which is sort of a play in terms of its structure off stagecoach. You just put a group of disparate characters in jeopardy and then story <coughs> there. So uh, there, there are some new westerns coming out. The Reverend, uh, the, uh, a new take on the Hugh Glass Mountain Man story oh, yeah. is coming out. And of course the remake of The Magnificent Seven. So a lot of activity in, uh, in westerns right now. Hell on Wheels on television has had a had a successful run, but nothing like the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Yeah, Hugh Glass, I think of there's a John G. Nyhart poem. He did a long poem on, on uh, Hugh Glass. Uh, I think it was for, saga, the saga of Hugh Glass, Nyhart did. Yeah. Uh, Frederick yeah. Manfred read, did a, a wonderful novel called Lord Grizzly, yeah. and there was a film with Richard Harris, yeah. uh, Man in the Wilderness, that was made about. Uh, yeah, Nyhart cycle of the West poems. Um, uh, before we we end, and I give you a, a, a few minutes just to sum up your thoughts. Just wanted to talk on something that people are obviously going to talk about. Um, over the course of the century or so, how do you think pro or con Hollywood or the Western itself has dealt with uh, American racism in regards to Indians and uh, uh, blacks like the Buffalo Soldiers? Um, what are some of the lowlights and some of the highlights that you could uh, point to just from a sociological perspective? Well, America has always had a schizophrenic uh, attitude toward uh, American Indians. And we, you see it in, um, from the beginnings of uh, American colonial history and from the beginnings of the Republic. But the classic example is Last of the Mohicans, uh, generally regarded as the first successful American novel. Uh, 1825, and you've got, you know, uh, Uncas, the noble red man, the perfect uh, Indian, and then you've got Magua, the evil Indian. And uh, I would argue that you see Magua and Uncas, you know, fighting for the heart and soul of America all through Western novels and Western films. Um, even in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, Buffalo Bill respected the Indian and gave them employment, and he had these living tableaus of Indian life in his show, but he also used them as the villain when they're chasing the Deadwood stage. Uh, and in most Western movies in the entire history of the genre, um, the Indians are just convenient villains. They're like the landscape, they're like the desert. It's something that has to be uh, overcome. Um, but after the success of uh, Delmer Dave's film, Broken Arrow, uh, based on Elliot Arnold's great novel, Blood Brother, about the friendship between Cochise and Tom Jeffords. Uh, Hollywood changed its attitudes and did a whole series, of course, of pro-Western films and sort of culminating in Dances with Wolves and the success of Dances with Wolves. And so Indian heroes became all the rage and you, you sort of see a decline in uh, the stock of older Western heroes like uh, Jim Custer, for instance, who's, you know, played by Harold Flynn in this incredibly heroic uh, version of Custer's Last Stand. They died with their boots on in 1941. And, uh, you know, he's played by Richard Mulligan as this raving lunatic, uh, this evil racist in uh, 1970s Little Big Man uh, by Arthur Penn. And so the Jim Custer stock falls from hero to heel uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, because he had been the symbol of the Indian Wars. Now, when American attitudes change about the Indian Wars, uh, he becomes the great villain of the story. And so, in a lot of ways, even in redemption, the uh, Indian stereotype is still a stereotype. But at least in a film like Dances with Wolves, I, I think there was a real effort to portray the Indian uh, culture uh, with uh, complexity, and the Indian characters all have complexity. And, uh, 
And so Hollywood's try, certainly trying, and that I think was was a uh, was a trial. Um, you know, there weren't many blacks in the West, although there were. And the story of blacks in the West has obviously been neglected. There haven't been many um, stories that featured, you know, important black characters. Although John Ford, of course, uses Woody Strode to great effect in *Man Who Shot Liberty Valance*, and Woody Strode was in a lot of Ford's films. He liked him very much, and then he gives Woody Strode a star trip, Sergeant Rutledge, which is the lesser of uh, Ford's cavalry pictures. And uh, but it's a real effort to address questions of American racism and use the Western to do so. And uh, I always admired Ford, too. He's born in 1890, so he's a man of his times. And uh, I admire people who overcome their racism and who try to do the right thing. And if you look at a film like Sergeant Rutledge, which still deals, of course, with the rape of a white girl by a black man, it's a theme of it, which is at that time a startling theme to American audiences. But nevertheless, Woody Strode is the hero of that film, and he gives him the full John Ford heroic treatment, and it's a wonderful representation of the Buffalo Soldiers. <clears throat> and during sort of the black exploitation films after the success of Shaft, you know, during the 60s, there was a series of black westerns, hmm. uh, you know, Soul Soldier and uh, and others and that uh, dealt with the story of the Buffalo Soldiers. So Mario Van Peebles made a, made a more recent western dealing with that, and so... I think we're seeing uh, black stars uh, emerge in the Western. Of course, more current Westerns uh, often have black characters. Uh, and the, the Western, in a sense, if you look at Wild Wild West, the, the movie version of that, um, the Western becomes colorblind, but in that sense it loses its basis in history because, you know, the West of the post-Civil War America was not colorblind by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, you know... Uh you mentioned Custer, and that got me thinking, uh, and I, I just Googled it, and I remembered uh, another Randolph Scott film that I think is underrated, too, called Seventh Cavalry. And interest, yeah, and the interesting thing is, it doesn't. it's the aftermath of Custer it deals with. Custer doesn't appear in the film. Randolph Scott doesn't play Custer. He plays a, a guy who knew Custer, who, who leaves uh, off on his own uh, uh, to, to go get his bride. And he's then involved or accused of uh, cowardice and whatnot. And he has to sort of prove himself by recovering Custer's body. And the interesting thing about that, about that film is it treats the Indians as intelligent beings, not just warlike savages, because, because you get a sense of the culture that they have now made the, the battleground where Custer fell is, 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 is sacred land, their sacred victory. And them trying to retrieve the body, they are the intruders going where they shouldn't be. And yet the Indians, you understand, just like we talk about Riker and Shane, we understand the motivations of the Indians. And it's it's only because of their religious beliefs about the afterlife when the when the horse of Custer comes riding over the hill, riderless, that they 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 let it go. And and they choose not to, even though they have overwhelming superiority in numbers, they choose not to be the violent savages. And the film just ends sort of on a little bit of a whimper. And it's such, in a, in a sense, an interesting film that it was made in the 1950s, yet it's probably 20 years ahead of its time in that it's sense. Real, it's a real interesting film. It's based on a Glendon Sword Out uh, short story, A Horse for Mrs. Custer. And yeah. um, it uh, is one of the last sort of favorable Custer films because the Randolph Scott character defends Custer and liked yeah. Custer. They were friends. And so uh, it kind of bucks the trend because uh, Broken Arrow had already aired. Uh, but it is a very, very interesting film and, um, and a very good uh, Randolph Scott vehicle. Holds up well. Well, Paul Hutton, thanks for your time. If, if you want to just take a minute or two and just uh, opine on anything you want about uh, the Western or if you have uh, any books or anything coming out, please let us know. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. This has been a great conversation. Um, uh, indeed, I do have uh, a brand new book, uh, The Apache Wars, coming out from Crown Publishers in New York uh, this spring. And um, folks can check it out on Amazon. Uh, and in May, they can find it in their uh, local bookstore. Um, and so uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And you can find a link uh, to uh, uh, Paul's homepage uh, uh, where he... Uh, uh, his University of New Mexico uh, below this video. Tomorrow, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, I'll have a conversation with three 
experts on television. And we'll be debating whether the early 40s and 50s, whether now during the cable age, or as I think the 1960 to 1980 era was the real golden age of television. So again, thanks, Paul, and uh, good luck in your further endeavors. Thanks so much, Dan.